He creates emotions. Navid Lancaster is one who tells you when to cringe during a thriller movie or when to cry. He is a film composer, sound designer, and musician who touches a global audience from his studio in Trinidad and Tobago. He has composed music for film, video games, mobile game apps, and animation. He is also a huge fan of Jimi Hendrix and the Japanese language. Konnichiwa, Navid. Welcome. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> so why Hendrix? Hendrix is literally the first guitarist that I ever took seriously. When I got into actually playing an instrument, instead of listening uh, to music. Uh, and I started playing guitar at the ripe old age of 19. I know for musicians, you're supposed to start like four or five, but I started at 19. And I was into, and still am, into you know, rock music. And I wanted to find out who was the best. To me, that was Jimi Hendrix. So much so, even my emails addresses are with Hendrix, not with Hendrix. So I'm a big Hendrix fan, as you could tell, you know, from the back there, there's Jimmy. <laughs> no, couldn't tell it. And what attracted you to the Japanese? Funny enough, I, I, I did not know why I got attracted to Japanese language until later. I was with my band at the time, Broken Mirrors, and I just got this feeling I had to learn Japanese. So I kept, I kept putting it off and I kept, that thought kept bugging me all the time. I walked to the band room one day and I said, watch, I just have this urge to learn Japanese. And my keyboardist at the time, uh, Marvin Haywood, he said they're teaching Japanese at the university and these extra crooked classes were so sign up. So I went there, learned Japanese for about a year. When I left my previous job, I ended up working at the University of Trinidad and Tobago as media archive person in the music technology department. And it so happens that the two people, they were one of the lecturers and one of the people with my, in my same position were Japanese. So we started off one time and from there we started. I, I worked there for about four years. Have you checked out the Japanese music, especially the rock scene? One of my favorite. Um, yeah, the, the, the Japanese rock scene is fantastic. It is. Uh, yeah. Bees and baby very metal. different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very different from American or British or even African metal or Brazilian metal. What I like ab ab about the Japanese uh, rock scene and the British one as well, they really incorporate the culture into the genre. I'm into that as well. How did you get into composing and sound design? I was a great listener of music. I discovered rock music at an early age because I was a very angry young man. Usually we all are, and then we get into that. And I used music as a way of letting my, my, my emotions out, my expressions out, any anger issues I had, went to the mosh pit, head banged, wall of death, got out all out there. And I decided when I was in Guyana, I actually went to Guyana for initially for three weeks, but I ended up, I liked the country so much, I ended up spending four months there. It was part of a major Baha'i teaching project. I'm a member of the Baha'i faith and they had a major teaching project going on there. And when I was 19, actually, same age, I decided to, to, to learn to play guitar. I ran to a fellow Baha'i, his name is J.B. Echo. And he, by the way, went and, and ended up playing a band called War and then ended up working with Carlos Santana. Mm. He and I was talking and, and he showed me something from the Baha'i writings about following your calling. I looked at that and I realized, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I went back home and I went back to, to Trinidad and Tobago because that's why I'm a Trini. And I took up my sister's guitar. My sister got her guitar for her birthday. Every time she left the house, I used to go into a room and play, play with the guitar a little bit, try to figure out stuff. One day she found out and got really mad and said, what, she has the guitar, I don't want it. And I'm like, cool. I used to be on the guitar for about, what, 18, 19, sometimes 20 hours a day. I used to sleep with the guitar on my bed, that kind of thing. I was really into it. So I, I got so good at it, I started teaching guitar. 
And one of the people who I taught guitar to said we should form a band. That band ended up being a band called Broken Mirrors. We were around for about 12 years playing rock, of course. We started incorporating various types of music like, you know, poetry, local idioms of our local culture started incorporating into music. And while I was working at the National Bicentre, I saw a producer, his name is Kenny Phillips. On the other television in the office, he was talking about music production. And I'm like, okay, I play guitar. It seems like this guy, he's doing music production. Let me find out what that's about. So after the interview, I called the, the television station and said, I just saw this program by this guy named Kenny Phillips. Um, I want to know what music production is about. And he said, but Kenny Phillips just left the studio. Here's his number. Give him a call. So I called Kenny Phillips. I said, okay, I just saw your interview. I want to know what this is about. He said, if you want to really want to know what this is about, you have to leave your job because uh, this is a very intensive thing. So I left my job. Literally, I just left my job. And went by him and he said, watch, I, I will teach you as much as I can teach you in three months. Uh, little did I know that was like three months of hell because back in those days, um, like a lot of the older heads, not just in Trinidad Tobago, but the older heads, and I guess in various countries will tell you that it's very militaristic. You start at the bottom, meaning you make tea, you make coffee, you're the gopher. So all the artists are really gonna, gonna, ha gonna let you have it. But you can't sit in the engineer's chair, that kind of thing is very militaristic. So for three months I did, but I wasn't up to scratch. And by the way, this is a weird thing. And, and it will date me as well. When I was working at my previous job, uh, Windows 95 had just come out. Before that, I was typing in DOS monochrome screen. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> when I went to, 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 to Kenny Phillips, he introduced me to a Macintosh, which I wasn't uh, you know, familiar with at all. The whole different operating system dropped me uh, with this program called Logic. I think it was Logic 3 point something at the time with two paying clients and the clock ticking right? Time is money. So I had to figure this stuff out, you know, wow. one time. So of course I made million and one mistakes, you know, uh, clients complaining, that kind of thing. But after those three months of literal hell where I, he was in another part of Trinidad, which is like almost deep South. And I was living in another part of Trinidad. I couldn't afford to go back and forth home. I used to sleep on the, on the studio floor. So I stayed oh, in wow. studios for days, but from there, I, I think even though it was the worst time to learn something in this field or, or, or line of work, it was the best time as well, because from there I, I had to learn how to keep, you know, customers happy, learn the programs very quickly, learn about music production, be fast on my feet when any technical issues happen, that kind of thing. From there, I, 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 I worked in another uh, studio for a few months, closer to home, where I was doing something completely different, where I was doing things like commercials, that kind of thing. Then from there, went to a, a studio called, called uh, Shaw Sound Recording Studios. I worked there for six years. Studios A and B ran both those studios where I, I did a ton of commercials, like a ton of commercials. And that, but also at the time, doing different types of music. So it wasn't just rock. I, I, I didn't even do any rock there, except maybe a couple of my own things. But I'm doing a lot of other genres. Right. So all these are stepping stones, right. To get to where I am, where, where I'm doing film music for film and sound design. I, I did things like Calypso's, Kaiso, Soka music, that kind of thing. Right. From there, started, got the age of learning Japanese, left, went to the university to work there and did a lot of live recordings of steel pan, Calypso's and also teaching, maintaining the music lab and teaching from uh, students about music production, that kind of thing, from, from some of the bigger and more established producers. So I learned a lot while also maintaining the labs. So while that was going on, uh, one of the gigs, live, live shows that we were doing, I, I was uh, recording, I, I saw this guy and his, and his companion at the time walked in with, with a camera and they were filming it. I just walked up to him and said, hi, my name is Navid. I'm doing the sound. The guy says, hi, my name is Steven Taylor. Keep that name in mind. I was like, yeah, cool. And I, I gave him a, a, a card. I had a little card and I went about my business. 
a few months later, he get, he calls me and says, I'm doing my film, my final film for university. And do you want to do the music for it? I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. That film called Buck the Man Spirit turned out to be a major hit. It won the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival, the People's Choice category. That was in 2012. The next year, I did another film with, with another director and his wife. Right, called Jamie Dark, that's Robert and Leslie Ann McFarlane. That film also won. Wow. So I was like, hey, I'm seeing a trend here. I started to advertise myself as the, as the premier film composer of Trinidad Tobago. So much so, I used to go on interviews and say, if your film wants to win an award, it has to pass through my hand. <laughs> Those are the exact words I said. <laughs> Wow. It so happens now that, that, that almost every film that I have done for the past 10 years have either won awards or been featured greatly worldwide. This last, this latest film that I, I have done with the same Robert and, and Leslie and McFarlane called Immune, that, that's the name of the film called Immune, which basically deals with a woman who is pregnant and she's immune to this virus. Go figure. Very timely. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was shot and, and edited and, and mixed entirely in England, but it's, well, the music was done here by me. That film so far has won, oh my God, I think about eight or nine awards, including Best Actress, Best Director, Best Film. And we're looking at uh, various, uh, in, in Rio, Brazil, I think it was, Berlin, and a few other places around the world. This film has been making the circuit, has been just be either being an official selection or just hitting awards. It's crazy. So this new film with Steven Taylor, and by the way, Steven Taylor, uh, very good friend of mine, very good director. He's, he's now married to uh, his wife named Reem, who is, they have, they have this gourmet granola called Reem gourmet granola, which actually is, is being sold in a uh, Chinese theater in, in, in LA, where all the big, big wigs go for the premiere their films in Hollywood. And that's, he was an intern for Will Smith and his company. He's a graduate of USC in, in, in directing. We just finished another film. I, I, I'll say, I could say this much about it because it's actually premiering in a few days. It's actually an award ceremony where he and his wife were the line producers, but I did all the, the music original music and the sound design. So that actually is going to be broadcasted on TV pretty soon. So when that happens, of course, I'll send you a link so you can take a look at it as well. So basically the, the moral of the story is you are what you declare. <laughs> yeah, you are, you are what you declare. And also seeing the logic of, of, of it all as well, because I mean, I started and still play guitar. You can tell from the back there, but it's also a case of synthesis audio or just needed in a lot of, uh, of places. So once you learn one instrument and you learn the computer part, but the technical part of it, you could combine them and you could take that talent to literally most places and most industries. So in terms of like animation, I used to walk in, I still do walk into these animation conferences and I'll be the only, everybody be, will be animators or directors or producers. And I'll be the only musician there. So mm. it was like, hello. And, and I, I'm one of those people who, who I think marketing is a great thing. To me, marketing is like a bright light in a dark room, right? And the bright light is just blinking, saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. <laughs> I know I have no problem advertising myself like crazy like that because uh, one of my goals, and I'm, I'm actually seeing it right now on my uh, vision wall, not out of a board, I just have a stick up on the wall. To be the biggest and most respected music producer in the world who bridges music and technology. That's my aim. That's my game. Oh, like it. When you are working on a project, do you have yeah. a vision of the final cut or does it evolve and write itself? A little of both. The main thing is, is that especially doing film on, uh, or other collaborative works, a few things. One, you are serving the story, right? It's not a case of Oh, look how great composer I am and, you know, beat my chest and have an ego thing about it. That's so not the case. If you entered this part of the industry for that, you'd be out the door before you, you could blink twice. <laughs> the, the, your thing is to serve the story and the vision of the director. 
So for example, and I can give a very recent example of uh, the same award ceremony show. Myself and Stephen, I saw the rough cut before uh, of the film and we had a spotting session. We sit down, he, uh, I asked him what he wants the audience to feel, what emotions he wants to portray with the vignettes of the various awardees, where he wants music to start and more importantly, where he wants, where he wants music to stop. It, it doesn't make any sense to have music all the way through. So these are the kind of things that, 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 that we go, go through. On the technical side, we have what's called STEMT, right? Which is, this, that's a very short, uh, short word for the Society of Motion Picture Engineers. And it's basically our, our minute second frame. So you know when to, from a technical side, where to stop, start music and where to stop music. So when you give that, and I don't want to go too, too technical, right? But when you hand over the film to people like myself or to the dialogue editor or a or, or, or colorist or any of these people that are in post-production. We know the frame rate for, for film, for example, is like usually 24 uh, frames per second for digital city, frames per second, that kind of thing. We all are running on the same timeline. So when we explain something to another department, they know exactly where and when, especially, we're talking about. It makes life a lot easier in the post-production process because I, I, I am part of post-production. When you're creating in the final version of the film, are you also part of getting it off the ground, like with the fundraising aspect of it, or is it just the composition? That's your role of it. Mainly just composition. I'm usually not part of promoting, like getting off the ground. In a sense, when I do market, the film is for selfish reasons. Uh, meaning saying, saying I put her on social media saying, I, I was part of this. Since I was part of this, get me more work, please. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically what every artist does. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so usually, and, and this comes back to one of the main things, technical skills are nice, but it's how you treat people as human to human. Yes. I am always on very good terms of any director or producer that, that I work with. So much so that depending on, on the film, I will get the script beforehand. So because usually composers will just get the final cut of the film. But I'm in good terms with a lot of these directors. I usually get the script beforehand so we can discuss ideas and I can even create demos beforehand, which will help in telling of the story and help clarify the vision for the director. And that right? saves time in the end too. It saves and time. And saves time. It saves yeah. a lot of time. So and the, directors, the directors must really appreciate that. Oh yeah, it, it, as I said, it's, it's back to human to human. And so much so that when it's time to promote the film and promote myself as a composer and or sound designer uh, for the film or music video or whatever form of is the final media, I, I, I usually ask them for the title, the screen title, and of course, a screenshot of the credits rule. Yes. So I could use that and say, I was part of this. And yeah. then of course, put out on blast everywhere. So what's your favorite part about the music making and filmmaking process? I look at those two as separate. In the music making process, if I'm doing my own music or uh, even doing a, a rescore for, for a, a, a film or a snippet of a film, my, my main thing, favorite thing is, and this is sound kind of weird, when I, when I hit a groove and I played back and if I could dance to my own music, yeah, I'm good. The funny thing, especially with today's technology, I would have like my phone and I'll get an idea. I'll just sing it into a voice note, come home, or if I'm home already, fire up the music computer, start playing. And when you get a vibe, it, it doesn't matter what time it is. And when my younger days, when I go in a studio, it's like two, and it's like two, three days I don't come out. I will smell different, but the music will sound fantastic. Now... <laughs> I, I could just come here where I'm um, three in the morning, roll out of bed, compose something, go back to sleep. If I get up in the morning and it's, it's, I still have that good feeling about it, then I could, I will develop it. The other thing in terms of film, when the filmmaking process or the animation process, or even when I do stuff for, for mobile apps, the favorite thing about it is when, when it gets, the music gets approved from director. Once they approve it, then that's your favorite part for me. Because as I said, it's, it's, it's to serve the story. It's not to serve my own egotistic purposes for doing 
a project. Once I'm on a project, I will give it my best because that's the reason why they wanted me on in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I'll give my best. And of course, so songs or concepts, of course, are subject to rewrites like everything else. When they want us, when they suggest to change something or ex or say things, they, because usually they, they don't speak in musical terms, right? So my one part of my job is to translate the technical terms or the feeling that they want to 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 to, to portray and turn that into music. If they say I don't feel this or I want something a little more blue or something of the, of the other. I have to take that, translate what they're saying and put it into music. It is a challenge sometimes, but that's what I signed up for. Where do you get some of your creative ideas for sound? Do you, you must watch and listen to other films and other musicians too, right? Yeah. One of the main things about being a musician, not just a film composer or sound designer, if you're a musician, you have to listen to almost everything, literally, because that's where you get your ideas from. When I was younger, I, 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 I didn't do that. I mean, I was all like, Metallica was, was the least of my worries. You, you're going heavier. So you're going like Iron Maiden, Dear Side, Black Sabbath. <laughs> so, we evolve but, as we get older. <laughs> Yes, yes, literally we evolve as we get older. But but funny enough, the 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 group that and it's so polar opposite. So what I used to listen to when I was like 13, 14, like exclusively when I was 13, 14, that's what I used to listen to exclusively. I discovered the carpenters for some strange reason. Mm. Once I got that, it was a case of anytime I hear the carpenters, I literally drop everything and listen to her voice. Oh, her voice, um, yeah. her, the music was perfect from her brother but her voice was and i still to this day i tell people when people ask it's a, it's a truck passing i don't feel hearing it of these speakers when people ask who is my favorite singer female singer it's karen carpenter bar none i'm a serious carpenter fan and then so between death metal <laughs> <laughs> And the carpenters, you have all the stuff in between. <laughs> I listen to, to I listen to a lot of stuff, music, dance music. Even even before uh, this interview, I was watching a whole biography on Crystal Waters, dance music, house music. So yeah, you listen to a lot of stuff. The reason why you do that is that you need a large, a really large pool of ideas to draw from. It, it also makes you versatile as well. So when an artist, when I used to produce music back in the day, or when a filmmaker or animator wants a certain feel from a certain culture, you could pull from that, that pool of, of knowledge that you've gained and learned. And then since I was a, a producer back in the day as well, I'm very much into, yes, you have the broad picture, of the music, but I, I like the story and listening to all the little stuff that makes a song great. And in production, it's also those little things that keep the song moving. Yeah, I'm really into that. So it's it's really a fun ride for me. Yeah? As, when people ask me how, how my life is, I say it's noisy. I like noise. I have no problem with noise. <laughs> You mentioned how the technology yeah. was for you at the beginning. Because of the amazing technology changes over time, how has that impacted your sound since you started? Um, it's impacted it greatly. Sometimes I listen back to stuff I did 15, 16 years ago and I cringe, but it's... <laughs> because like a it sounds, That's right, that's right. <laughs> because it sounds were not right. Now, with these days, um, with better sampling of, of sounds, with better dynamic range, dynamic range is basically the difference between low, soft, or loud, and access to, to, to different instruments. Or even with the instruments I, I, I use, I mean, the guitar is there. I could hook that up to a synth. I could hook that up to different other, other pieces of technology, and it will sound way apart from the original sound of the guitar. And then on top of that, you have, because I have my, my piano right here, my piano is hooked up to my music computer and I could get a wide variety of sounds from various cultures, which is something.
something that you got to do back in the day, even back in the day when you could have done it, it won't have sounded that good. One thing about technology is that, especially with, 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 with the past 10 years, or even be before that, that people who have access to, people have access to music technology to create music, which is good. The bad thing is that people have access to recording technology, but you're going to be hearing a ton of crap, but you'd also, the, the competition has been raised because not everybody, if you have a, a Mac, you will get garage band, for example, as a default, as a default program, you could create music immediately. So it's a case of myself for me raising my game because now i'm not just competing with established producers established composers you're going to compete you'll be competing with anybody who has access to com a computer mm -hmm. you know and, and, then, and then and then access to distribution too. as well yeah. yeah there's hidden gems out there as well yeah then of course distribution channels youtube for example yeah. the playing field a level playing field that's, a lot, the playing right? Field. that's yeah. right yeah and if and particularly if you're in a place where it you're isolated and you don't have access you don't mm. have access to LA where you where you're sitting on in TNT and right. I don't have access to it here in Alberta but mm. we do have access to it through That's right. technology if we That's want right. it, if we want it um, uh, the the interesting thing about it is that especially during this unfortunate pandemic time that we have experienced for the past almost two years. I took advantage of that, meaning that I know that the, the big wigs in industries, they weren't going out anywhere, they were home. True. So what they do at home, they turn on, you know, their computer and see what's the next big thing. So for the past two years, I've been marketing myself like a madman and I've gotten, gotten some progress in that as well. That's a good lesson right there. So do you plan on producing more albums for yourself? Oh, yes. I actually have an album in the works. I already started it. So that will be coming soon. I, in 2019, I had put out an album. That was my first time trying an orchestral album. It's called The Gate. It's on SoundCloud. But I'm going to take that album now and actually remix it. Because that was the first time I tried like a full orchestral instrumental album but for this upcoming album which is called lonely boots and upper stories the album cover has already been made it is actually created by anthony phils who is a famous stack designer he's an award-winning stack designer he and i are actually members of the team that was from india we created from his ideas an app called unbreakable which won the silver medal at the international design awards you know in 2020 he designed my album cover, which was basically a picture I, I took of a pair of boots that <laughs> was, that was, uh, a workman left it there. And, 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 and Trinidad and Tobago, we have something called the City Gate, which is like one of the main transportation thoroughfares in Port of Spain. I was there like, I was coming home late, like maybe 9, 10 at night, walking up the steps. And I just saw this pair of boots there. So I just took various pictures of the of those pair of boots that became the album cover. Cool. So this album are actually a real multicultural album with Chinese influence, local influence with the steel pan. We have some rock in it as well, and a few other influences. I already started working on that album. Awesome. I think that probably when you're if you ever work on a film that is not an award winner, you're probably going to be very disappointed. It oh, yes. like everything you touch turns to gold. <laughs> I'm, I'm slowly but surely making myself known. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say to somebody who's thinking about getting into music scoring and sound yeah. production? What are their have-to-haves and what are the opportunities that they have? Okay, I'm going to start with the very general one and get a little more specific. One, you have to be willing to work <laughs> and work very, very, very hard. The reason why I'm saying this is that each year, thousands of students come out. And I, know, I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to, to film composing school. I, I did it the old-fashioned way, School of Hard Knocks. There are lots of students that are coming out every year from film schools. So you have that, every year that happens constantly. That's not, that's not gonna stop anytime soon. 
you have a very limited amount of films that are coming out every year, whether it's from student films all the way up to big, big um, multinational companies. You have to have in your roster a very high caliber of production. Now, the good news is that, and, and, me, and what I mean by that is that you have to have music that is already set to, to film, mm. right? So you have, so people could see how you can marry the, those two disciplines together. It has a, a company called the QTube, which I'm very good friends with, with, with the, the founder of the QTube. His name is Brian Waters. Go to the QTube.com, start building your resume. Mm. That's one. Two, you have to have at least a decent sound reel, right? So people could see your, well, people could hear your range. So SoundCloud is actually a very good, very good avenue for that. You make YouTube your friend, make sure you have a website because we do not own our social media, right? We don't own Facebook, we don't own Instagram, but we can own our website. So you can put your various posts there or guide people to your website. If you don't know how to create a website, no biggie. You have like Wix.com, you have Squarespace.com, you have templates, you can work from there. So that's the general. Specifics. Do not, I repeat, do not go around cap in hand looking for work. The amount <laughs> of directors that will, that, that have been bothered every day like that, for you to be another one of that, that's guaranteed rejection. I see that every day online, right? Uh, and it's that's so not the way to do it. What you have to do, you have to add value, which is way different from, from, from walking around saying, I'm a composer, give me some work, please. That's not going to happen, right? How you add value? One of the ways to do it is to connect. If you're a film student, right, for example, or, or from film school, Connect with your, your, your film buddies from school, from last year, because uh, they'd be looking for, for composers. Join up with them and you will have a lifelong partnership, right? Because as they move up the ranking, so will you. And your resume will start to expand. Another way of, uh, another way of adding value is, and I, 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 I do this and I have no shame in doing it, Call, call a couple of reporters, get yourself in the newspaper, right? Do a short interview, let them do a short interview of you. You take, you buy two or three copies, right, of that newspaper. Keep two of them. Use the other one for scanning. Scan make digital versions of, of, of that article. Put it on blast on social media. People will not hire you if they don't know who you are. For you to get above the fray of these thousands upon thousands of, of always coming film composers or designers, people will have to see you. And the only way to do that is to market yourself like crazy. Nothing is wrong with marketing. It's not an ego thing. It's a business thing. It's a survival thing, right? Also, with these directors and producers, go to where they are and just talk to them. Study their works, which would be nice. Study their works so you have something to talk about and say, I like your work, how you've done such and such and such and ask questions. Become interesting. It has to be genuine. Not it has to be genuine. Fake. That's right. You can't just go cap in hand. That's instant to the door, leave kind of thing, <laughs> right? It's back, it's all back to human to human relationships. They won't know who you are unless you show yourself to be valuable. If, if they don't have work for you now, they'll either remember you further down the road for something that they might think you're a good fit to be in, or they would refer you to another director. The first thing that director will ask that, that, that director who refer them is how is this person to work with? How good is this person to work with? Because skills, are, after a while, become ubiquitous. You can press a MIDI keyboard and you can produce a note. You can sing la 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 and you can put it on YouTube. That's beside the point. Skills are ubiquitous. It's how you treat 
people and how people treat you will make you move up the ranks. Mm -hmm. Now, the, another thing, people will ask how long does it take? That's another question people usually ask. And I was seriously say about 12 years. I started my career in 2012, we're in 2022. It's during that time, I just had to keep stacking up the credits, stacking up the leverage. For you to hit the bigger stuff, people have to see that you can handle all this stuff beforehand. Yeah. And work out all your kinks. There's no um, overnight success. There's no overnight success. Anybody who says that they're overnight success, they're lying or they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> And another piece of advice, this is not glamorous. It has a glamorous moments, yes, but it is not a glamorous job. It is a work, it is a art, it is, it is a craft. The, once people can understand that and know that this is something for the long game, then they have a shot for, uh, of, of doing this. So yes, you could have passion and these kind of things which will help you in the darkest moments. And trust me, I have had my fair share. But at the end of the day, as they say in Trinidad and Tobago, if this is for you, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, what a great way to end the broadcast. Thank you. Yes.